74. Preview Shock. Hello, I believe we're live. Not 100% sure what's happened there. Adam Bates isn't producing today, but seems to feel the need to go in and fiddle with things so that they look different every single time that we use them. I'm your host, Dan Bardell, here for the 1874 match preview as Villa make the short trip to Molyneux on Sunday. I am joined by my good friend, one of my favourite people in the world, David <laughs> Reed. Joyous scenes on his social wow. media last night as he celebrated the, the late, late John McGinn goal. Didn't you, David? I don't know where you were. It looked like Box Park. I assume they weren't showing Villa Europa Conference League games at Bucks Park, though. No, no. I'm sure the celebration police will be on to me about that Instagram. I really Instagram enjoyed post. it. I did this morning. Really brightened <laughs> up my morning. <laughs> I went to, um, it's, a, it's a bar called Feed the Yak in Elephant and Castle. Oh, nice. And uh, it's, the, it's the meeting place for the uh, Villa London group. So it's oh, my first time there. Was it? Uh, packed full of Villa fans. Lovely atmosphere. Chatted to a few people. It was, yeah, very nice. Had a great time there. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be going back. Were they overjoyed to have the the famous Dave Reid in attendance? I don't think so. No, no I, think, I would have yeah. been. I would have been because <laughs> I try and get I try and get Dave Reid out all the time, and it, this guy <laughs> is impossible to pin down and get on a get on the beers. Dave Reid, absolutely no plan, chance. Plan three months ahead. You got to plan three months ahead. He's a busy, busy boy, isn't he? Right then, let's talk about Villa at Wolves. There, actually, no. We'll start with we'll start with last night. I found the game, I don't know if there's something wrong with me. I know, to be honest, I've, my neck's been hurting all week, so I am quite pilled up. But I was like sat at the... The first half was pretty tedious, let, let's be perfectly honest about it. But obviously, I was sitting in the halt. When we were attacking the halt in the second half, I actually found the game really, really enjoyable. It was like, I don't know whether you played the game when you were a kid of a attack v defend. So you take yeah. it in turns to attack and, attack and defend, and it was just Villa. It was their turn to attack in the second half, and... They were pinned. They were pinned in, weren't they? We just we just couldn't. It seemed like we were going to get get the breakthrough. I was saying to Martin, who I was sat next to, and and Lee, I was saying, I still think we'll score. I do think we'll score at some point, but we did leave it very very late. But it, it won't do us any harm winning in that way. And I think sometimes in those games, it doesn't matter how you do it. You just have to win. Yeah, in a, in a, in a I'm kind of feel the same as you, really. In a, in a perverse sort of way, I actually quite enjoyed the game. Uh, the, the first half wasn't wasn't particularly great I thought we looked okay but I was actually a little bit surprised at how well organized I probably shouldn't be really surprised but it probably sounds a bit disrespectful I was surprised at how well organized they were and how compact they were and actually how good they looked on the break as well now whether that might be down to us not being particularly good in our kind of rest defense when we've got the ball and and we're kind of in pin pin them in their in their final third and where our players are placed ready for any counter attacks whether there was a bit of slopping us on our part there probably was but I was quite impressed with how well they did on the break and how they looked to try and and get in behind us um and obviously how well organized they were in the first half second half as you say felt a little bit more unbalanced it was more attack versus defense but I said to the people I was with last night on 60, 65 minutes. The goal's coming here. I wasn't too kind of stressed out about it. The goal's coming. We don't need to worry too much. I thought it was just a matter of time. And then by the time it got to uh, 85 minutes, my anxiety levels were rising, rising. Then we got into added time. And yeah, as you'll see on my uh, on my Instagram story, I was celebrating like we'd like we won the league in the 93rd yeah. minute. I was here for it. I really, really enjoyed it. Like, like I said this morning, it was a kind of a weird formation in the second half as well. So we basically went three at the back. Cash was a was a winger. Bailey was a winger on on the other side, and we kept going and going and going. But we did make hard work of scoring. But in fairness, you know that they made so many blocks. And actually, if you look at the stats, I think we had like 25, 26 shots. But at one point, I don't know whether this changed at the end with the McGinn goal. But you looked at the stats, so we'd had twenty five shots or whatever it was. I think they had had three. But if you looked at the big chances, it was Villa nil, them one. Yeah, that first one in the first half had mm, uh, had, had my, got my heart rate going. That's for sure. And I was the thing was with our chances were as well. I thought on another day, I think we would have scored earlier in the game. The, the number of shots that we had, and actually their goalkeeper made some saves, but it was almost like he wasn't trying to parry the ball or deflect the ball wide of the goal. It was almost like he was saving the ball. And it was bouncing back into our six into their six yard area. And on another day, a ricochet falls to one of the Villa players, and they put it in the back of the net. So I think on another day, we probably would have scored earlier in the game. It was just rotating the squad, players needing minutes, a little bit of rustiness, a little bit of decision-making of thoughts off at times in terms of when to pass, when to play that final ball, when to take on a player. 
um, was a little bit off at times. But you've got to expect that when players are coming in and playing that haven't had a lot of minutes. So mm. I was confident that we would win the game. I wasn't quite as, uh, you know, as um, I wasn't, wasn't quite thinking that it would ha- do it in that time of the game. I thought it would happen earlier. It's quite one of those ones. If you go 1-0 up early in the second half, you probably win 3-4-0. But because you mm. don't score, it, become, it becomes more difficult. They sit deeper. There's the time wasting as well. They had a lot of players go down with the injuries. I was surprised it was actually only six minutes of stoppage time. I thought there'd be a lot more than that. But the captain, John McGinn, popped up with a, with a real captain's goal to, to win the game for Villa. And Villa are now off the mark in the group because we, at one point it was looking like we were going to be we were going to be bottom and it, it might prove to be a struggle. So that three points is, is massive. And now we head into the game against Wolves. And actually, in some ways, it's going to sound stupid because we did have all the ball in the, in the second half, but almost energy levels are conserved, conserved, sorry, because, you know, it was, it was quite methodical in what we had to do. We had to build up quite slowly and just swing crosses into actually in that second half, although we had the whole of the game, I actually feel like energy would have been saved in the second half, if, if that makes sense, compared to if it had been a, an end-to-end game. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. Um, I, you know, I, I think the changes at half-time, bringing those players on means that, you know the the players have kind of kept ticking over. They won't. Yeah, have to I like that. Of, they won't have to do a lot of training. It's just they get forty five minutes tick over uh, recovery and then go again on Sunday. So I think those changes bringing on Ollie. Well, I thought Duran played actually quite well in the first half, but uh, Ollie Watkins getting that second half as well. Um, so I think yeah, having a lot of the ball helps in conserving energy. Doesn't it? you're not running around chasing chasing the football as much. So yeah, in terms of energy levels, you would expect them to be ready to go Sunday. Yeah, it's a it's a tough place to go Wolves for Villa. They've not got a great record there. The only time we've won there recently it was during the COVID season when there was when there was no fans and even that was a, a last minute penalty or a stoppage time penalty. So Villa don't have a great record at Molyneux. Before we've come on, Jacob Tanswell, our good friend at the Athletic, has reported that Jacob Ramsey has had a recurrence of his metatarsal injury, so he will not be available at the weekend. It's a it's a blow. I've actually heard conflicting information. Emery isn't doing a doing a press conference today. He's got like a PLP interview at 2.30 and the quotes will be will be fed out. It's not a normal press conference as, as Villa would normally do. But I've actually heard from one source that it's the same foot and I've heard from another that it's a, it's a different foot but the, but the same injury. So hopefully Emery will be able to firm that up in the in the 2.30. But it's a blow, isn't it? Because he came on and scored last week. We, we need all the options we can get. We, we're having a good season in the Premier League, one three in a row. But it does feel like every time we, we feel like we're about to get going, Another injury pops up. We, we seem to have been really unfortunate with the injuries so far this season. Yeah, absolutely. I'm gutted for Jacob, actually. He was just coming back, wasn't he? Same just, happened with Moreno as well, didn't it? Yeah, just getting that sharpness back. And same for Moreno, set back. Um, we're not quite sure how long Ramsey's going to be out for this time. But if it is a full re- reoccurrence, then you would expect maybe six to eight weeks probably out again, which is such a such a blow for him and... Obviously, not great for Villa's squad depth either because he's such an important player um, and has been over the last 18 months or so. So, yeah, gutted for him. He was just getting back into his stride. Scored that goal against Brighton and you're thinking, right, let's let's get him more minutes, more time on the pitch and he's he's going to be able to, to really get back to that top level that he showed previously. So, absolutely gutted for him. Yeah, you'd hope DRB and Kamara might be back again. We don't know at the moment because Emery hasn't had his press conference, but it kind of got the impression that it was more of a precaution that they didn't play last night's games. DRB is, is the real key one for, for this game, isn't he, against Wolves? He he makes Villa an infinitely better team, I think. 100%. Massive, massive, um, massive player already for Aston Villa. I'm a little bit more pessimistic over Kamara and DRB just because... I didn't get the feeling um, in the Europa Conference League pre-match press conference that the manager was confident that they would be available for the weekend. He's not going to take any risks. I I get that um, in a game on a Thursday night in in that context. But I didn't quite get the uh, rush of confidence because he was asked about whether they'd be okay for the weekend. And it it was a, a kind of kick the can down the road answer. He was like, not too sure yet. So it wasn't anything like, yeah, they'll be fine for the weekend. They'll be back, you know, full training on Thursday or Friday. So it'd be interesting to see, I think, both of those players, obviously we talked about it previously, how important they are for for Villa, Kamara, Diaby. They've been so good. Zaniolo kind of started in the Diaby position last night. Mm. So I wonder if Diaby doesn't make it, whether Zaniolo will, will kind of fit in into that slot if he's absent. 
Um, so. You'd have thought so. And then, of course, Tielemans is, is the obvious option in midfield rather than probably going with Dendonka there. But two massive players and you just got to hope they are fit for Sunday. Yeah, that would mean Bailey would probably play as well. And, you know, he, he had some bright moments last night, particularly in, in the second half. I can't say I noticed him actually in the first half, but he, but he wasn't alone. In the second half, he took some responsibility and was was good on the ball. But Wolves hasn't been a happy hunting ground. It is a, a game that they are always up for. I don't think the Villa fans look at it quite in the same way as the Wolves fans look at it. I think they treat it more of a derby than than Villa do. But maybe Villa need to start treating it as a derby because they do always create a feverant atmosphere at, at Molyneux and they do just always seem to beat us. So, us going there, having won three Premier League games in a row, and now we've obviously won in Europe as well. We go in there with a little bit of momentum. But I feel like we went there with a little bit of momentum last season and and and, and lost one nil. We we always seem to go down early there, so I think it's important that Villa don't do that. Maybe they stay compact at the start of the game because once we go one nil down at Molyneux, we, we never seem to be able to get back for, for for whatever reason. And this is going to be a tough game that they've not been doing great, but then they go and beat Man City last weekend as well, which again feels pretty typical just as they're about to, to, to play us. So it is going to be a really horrible game for Villa because it just always is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it always is. Um, I th- Wolves, I feel like, are going to be a side that, that, that might get better as the season goes on. I feel like they're a bit of a work in progress at the moment under Gary O'Neill as he kind of gets his feet under the table. Obviously, he came in very late towards the start of the season and he's now trying to, you know, impress himself on the on the team and imprint his style on, on on the team. I was very obviously very impressed with him against Manchester City. I was very impressed with him against Manchester United yeah, at Old really Trafford. Good, um I was impressed with them for parts of the game against Liverpool and then it kind of got away away from them a little bit. But the there seems to be something happening there's something building I think at Molyneux as well it feels like there's a bit more of a connection between the supporters of Wolves now to the team I think that kind of got lost a little bit particularly under Bruno Large and then probably over the summer there was a little bit of a malaise as well just because of the the uncertainty around Lopetegui whether he would stay whether he would go whether there's any money available whether they've strengthened the, the squad enough but now the window is closed the game against Liverpool I know they lost it but there felt like there was a little bit more going happening between the fans and the team. And then again against Manchester City, feels like there's something happening there at Wolves now where, particularly at home, I think they're going to be very, very difficult to beat. And when you've got absolutely top top quality player like Neto, I think he is absolutely top draw. And I'm, I'm so, well, I'm glad for him because he had a horrible injury. And just before that injury, I know Liverpool were looking at him and, and potentially looking to sign him. He, he is a player that can reach that Champions League football level. And I think he's starting to show that once again. I think his ball carrying is absolutely outstanding. He, you know, supplement that with uh, Cunha, who I've been quite impressed with at the start of the season. He's not maybe going to bag you 20 goals a season, but I've been quite impressed with him as a kind of deep line striker, who someone who can actually, you know, hold the ball up play and be played off but also I like him when he drops deep picks at the ball turns and runs at you and then if they can get a you know a consistent performances out of Huang as well I think that's a, a really good front three so it, you know th- there might be something happening at Wolves and it's down to Gary O'Neill to get that out of the team I think he's still trying to work out exactly what he wants them to be does he want them to be a counter-attacking side which is probably where they might end up I suggest with that coming. front three that is going to be where they end up yeah um and he, he kind of flipped the formation as well. It was something that he did at Bournemouth, flipping between four at the back and, and five at the back. And they switched to three against Manchester City, which Bournemouth tended to do against the top teams as well. They used to kind of switch between three three at the back and four at the back when they face when they face the top team. So I, I kind of would expect him to go back to four against, against Villa on Sunday, just to give them a little bit more front-footedness, I guess. Um, so it'd be interesting to see where they go with it tactically. I really like Mario Lamina as a player as well. He'll kind of drop, if they play four at the back, he'll kind of drop between the two centre-backs and pick up the ball and look to dictate. And he's really good in the tackle as well, off the ball. I'm re- I really like Lamina. Uh, Joao Gomez is another one, young player that they brought in. And I think he's someone who who might well develop into the next, next kind of Ruben Neves style player or type player. Um, he can have a big impact on the side. Um, so options for them midfield. Bellegarde is still going to be suspended. I think he's serving the last of his of his ban from his uh, from his red card earlier in the season. So it will probably be it'll either be a kind of four three three or a similar kind of three four three that we saw that we saw against Manchester City. 
I think you're right about Wolves fans and maybe creating the connection. I think obviously they qualified for Europe under Nuno, and you know when you do, when that happens, you have an expectation in your head that you want to continue around the around those places. And I think maybe Wolves fans have had that over the last couple of years. I think with the finances this summer, I think they actually realise where they are, and they're almost ready for the fight and up for the fight, particularly at Molyneux, making it a very pl- very tough place for, for away teams to go. I think you're right with what you've said there. I think they realise the Wolves fans, where they are, the job that Gary O'Neill is going to have to undertake, that it's not going to be easy. And sometimes with that, it almost can create like a, a siege mentality. And I, I do think that's perhaps what's on the cusp of of, of Wolves. I, I, when we were doing Sky in the summer, I said about, I think Wolves will be in relegation trouble. And actually, Wolves fans really got on my back on Twitter, I don't, I don't think. To be honest, I think that wasn't as much to do with what I said. Which I which fan base fun. hasn't got on your back, Dan? I mainly was. I've had wars. I've had Arsenal in the in the, in the past. I think Newcastle. <laughs> I think Newcastle fans like me and uh, Manchester United fans. But yeah, I've had a few. But I think it was more to do with the fact that I was a Villa fan saying it rather than what I was actually saying. Because I do think now they do realise where, where they are. They, they they did shift a lot of players, like you said about being impressed with them against Manchester United. But actually, a big part of that was Matteo Nunes. In midfield, mm. he was really good that night. They, you know, they've lost him. They've lost a hell of a lot of players in the summer. But that front three is very mobile. Could be something that causes Villa problems at the weekend, particularly as we've seen in the past. If we operate with the high line, depending on which version of the high line c- comes out, they've they've lost a hell of a lot of, of of key players. But there is still some 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 really good players there. For I think Jose Sarr in goal. I think he was getting a bit of stick last season. New goalkeeping coach, someone we know well. In, in Neil mm. Cutler, he seems to be having a, a more solid start to the season. Craig Dawson's a player that always seems to have the game of his life against Villa, whoever, whoever he's playing for. He was magnificent against Manchester City last week. So I actually think this is a, a real big test for Villa just because it is somewhere stereotypically they haven't done well. And Wolves do feel like they've not got momentum, but you know, they're carrying a, a few positives after the result last week. Yeah, definitely. And, and Neto and, and, and Huang, if he plays, they'll kind of stay high and wide. And then Cunha will be the one to to drop into midfield and and help out um, whether it's a two or a or a three in central midfield. So yeah, and and defensively, as you say, Ballon Dawson, Virgil Van Dawson, whatever you want to call him, I feel like he's be. I I'm not sure. I, I don't know off the top of my head how old he is, but I feel like he's Must been be like. 30. Th- I feel like he's been thirty three for about six years, Craig I'm Dawson. Look. So. But he's obviously still a, a top-level defender. I know the West Ham fans were gutted when Yeah, when they he loved left. him. Um, they absolutely loved him. Um, but yeah, I feel like individual performances are improving. I've, I've, I've always kind of looked at Nelson Semedo as a at right-back as a position that you could probably get at Wolves. Mm. But he's been better, his actually. Level, his level has gone up this year, no doubt. And as you say, Jose Sarr, I was looking... Um, I, I, was, I was kind of looking earlier this morning. I think he's claimed most crosses of, of any Premier League goalkeeper um, so far this season, so it feels like you know Cuts is doing a job that he did with Martinez. Martinez loves coming out and and getting um, and and getting crosses. So, um, oh, I think you've gone you've gone quiet, Dan. What's happened to your mic? <laughs> that, that leaves me that leaves me on my own to talk. <laughs> Shall I read some comments out? I feel like the the the, the, the role has flipped here. Michael says, we need to treat this as a derby and start on the front foot with aggression. <laughs> John says, Zaniolo is still adjusting to the league. He'll be great for us. Uh, I think Bailey and Zaniolo, this is from Luke, I think Bailey and Zaniolo, so much weaker than Buendia and Ramsey, mainly in terms of work ethic and aggression, um, which I think is interesting. I thought Bailey was, was pretty good yesterday. I think there were a couple of times when maybe Bailey should have... Um, Pass the ball, or 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 made a different decision in the final third. But I think that was at a time when we were kind of feeling uh, a little bit more, a little bit more desperate towards the end of the game. Adam says leave him on mute, but I thought I could hear a little little muffle from you there. Are you off mute now? He's off. He's totally off now. Fantastic. Great to see. Great to see. Uh, Zaniolo, yeah. So I, I don't know what people thought about him in the uh, kind of shadow striker Diaby role, but I think he provides a little bit of. Something well, slightly different profile of player, isn't it? Zaniolo up there, off of uh, off of Ollie Watkins. So it'd be interesting whether if Diaby isn't fit, whether Zaniolo plays. And then um, and then you've got Ollie Watkins up front. And I know people will have seen the um, the David Ornstein news this morning about uh, Ollie Watkins signing a new contract. I don't know whether 
that will have to um, that will end up coming to fruition. I assume it will be because he's he's uh, very trusted and well sourced journalist David Ornstein. It's kind of something we've been expecting for uh, a while. This this Watkins contract. I'm not really felt like it wasn't going to happen. So it feels like now that that is all finalised and he's getting ready to uh, to be announced. So I'm back. Um, I can hear you, Dave. Oh goodness. What happened there? How did you how did you find that going on your own? I felt like alone? I struggled. I felt like a fish out of water. If you stick a if you stick a camera on, um, you know, and you're kind of sat in a studio with lights, I feel all right. But when I'm not usually the host, and then you're thrust into it, carnage, mate. I will say, Dave Reid, usually very good in the pressure situation. When we were doing the transfer <laughs> shows in the summer, the auto queue went down. And let me tell you, Dave Reid handled it like he was hosting. And I've never seen anything like it, the way he handled <laughs> it. But mixed reviews. I'll go back I'll go back and, and, and look look at how he did in the gap. Yeah, I'll get your feedback, wasn't, please, wasn't feedback. Dave, David Stiles is saying your Sky creds are really coming to use now, Dave. So he, obviously <laughs> did a, he obviously did a semi-decent job, Dave. I had absolutely no idea what happened there. It was like my laptop just blew up. <laughs> for no reason i did see someone in the comments saying i was much better on mute as well but then right. you, have to, you have to just look at my face as well rather than listen to him i don't yeah. know, I don't know see your mouth the, move is that the lesser of two evils not sure where were we i've completely lost where we were dave what were you talking well, about well so have i i started banging on about zaniolo started talking oh, nice. about watkins new contract bailey oh good you've done a lot yeah, then in that two minutes <laughs> everything really <laughs> i will say um i will say i did have a look and craig dawson's 33 as well, he's been th- as, as I say, he's been thirty-three for yeah. five years. Yeah, ridiculous. And still, still seems to be getting better. I wanted to talk to you about Tillemans because if Kamara doesn't play, you expect it will be Tillemans that that plays. He was getting a bit bit of stick last night in the ground, and I've seen stick on social media as well. It's very early days. He hasn't played consecutive games. This guy, trust me, is a very high level footballer. What I will say is, I don't think he's ever really played in the midfield two before. So I'm not, I thought he looked better last night actually when Villa went to three in midfield. And it was kind of Louise sitting there, McGinn and uh, McGinn and Tillemans were in front of Louise. He gives the ball away, but what I was saying, and I used to say this about Buendia, gives the ball away because he's he's trying to make stuff happen. He's trying to progress the ball. And actually, if you, he didn't have a great game last night. Don't get me wrong, but actually, if you look at his stats from last night, he was first in a lot of uh, a lot of positive metrics, which which you know to the, some people might take them by surprise. I think the key thing here is if Kamara is out. They're not the same type of player, are they? So it, it does become a little bit difficult for him. Louise probably would have to be the one to sit a bit more. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't think. I don't think Tielemans was 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 poor last night. I don't. He, the whole end were not enjoying his performance. I will say. I don't. I don't. I mean, I wouldn't say that he was any worse than a lot of the other players on the pitch, really. And I don't think it was a. I don't think Villa as a whole, would, as a collective, were terrible. Um, I'm not gonna. I don't think. I don't think we should kind of cast judgment on. on it's too early. Just yet. It's 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 way too early. Way too early. I think he's gonna. It's obvious that he's gonna take time. And I know people are frustrated a little bit. Um, and then you also have to consider what's the manager asking him to do. The manager will be asking him to do certain things within a within a game. Now, is he the one that's being tasked with? getting hold of the ball and make it or trying to make things happen and make the difficult passes. And if he is, you have to take that in, into consideration as well. Um, you know, I think I think he will be a good player for Aston Villa. Um, but as you say, is he going to be getting in the team so far ahead of Kamara and, and Louise? Probably not. So it's going to be up to him when he comes in to try and make an impression. And maybe he's trying too hard. That, that might be something as well. Yeah. The fact that he wants to play every week and maybe he is trying to make things happen and he's trying to be the main man in midfield in order to force his way into the starting eleven. So maybe he just needs to relax a little bit. You know, I think Villa fans have a high expectation of Tielemans and maybe he, you know, he wants to meet that. Maybe he just needs to... Relax a little bit, and and maybe you know if if there is an injury, and we obviously we don't want an injury in midfield. You know, if there is an injury and he gets a run of games, maybe that will give him the time and ample opportunity to relax a little bit. I think there's gonna there's obviously a lot of eyes on him because he'll be on a significant wage, uh, given that he moved on a free transfer, and given that you know he's he's been a player that a lot of people in the game have been aware of since he was fifteen, sixteen, like. People watch Tielemans because he's been a player of of significant interest for a lot of people for a number of years already, and he's still youngish in terms of the footballer's career. 
So he should he should be pleased. Physics. Yeah, so he's, he's coming into that time now where he wants to be playing every week and nailing and nailing down a, a side. But he's gone a, a place in the side. But he's gone from a, a team at, at Leicester City. Obviously, did terrifically well at Leicester. But then obviously there was a clear drop off in performance, not just him, but a, a lot of players at Leicester. And now he's trying to rediscover that top top level form. So I think it's just going to take him a little bit of time. I understand the frustration, but I also don't think he was, you know, absolutely terrible yesterday at all. No, I do think it's difficult when you're in and out of the team as well and you're having to come on and try and make an impact. I, I prefer to take my view of him from something that I saw as a positive and that was the Palace game when he came on. I thought he really took that game by the scruff of the neck when he came on. Again, he gave the ball away, but he also played some really key passes. He played the pass through to Watkins that won us the penalty. I think this is a, Tillemans is a different type of player to Louise or Kamara. I think maybe that's what some people who are criticising him aren't realising. Louise is just all-round brilliant. Uh, there's not really anything that, that that he can't do. Kamara is more the more defensive of the two. He's very good at breaking up the play, getting his foot in and, and winning the ball or taking up clever positions defensively to, to pick up the ball. And he's good in transition defensively as as, as well, Kamara. Tillemans really isn't isn't the same as either of those players. He's not as mobile as them. That That's not his game. Tillemans' his game is being deep and playing really incisive passes and progressive passes and key passes and really trying to make a, t- a team click. And I would suggest, as a player coming in and out, it's, that's a difficult job to do when you're not playing every week. Yeah, and you know, you also you got to think about when Unai Emery came in at Aston Villa, how long did it take the players within that squad to change the way they play? to understand yeah. what the manager is asking of them. It didn't happen overnight. It wasn't an immediate. Now, some players can take that on, as we've seen. Musi Diaby comes in straight away and is the, one of the first names on the team sheet. But it, it takes some players different amounts of time to, to get used to what the manager is asking them to do. It's a different way of playing for him. So I, I certainly don't think we should be you know, using him as the kind of player to target because there's... there's you know, you, you, and a prime example, right? Matty Cash, when he when Uno Emery came in, was on the bench a lot. Ashley Young was the starting right back who kind of shifted and played the the situational hybrid centre back, right right centre back role. And Matty Cash had to take his time to get into the team, and now he's in the team. He's flying, and he's and he's getting better, and he's getting better, and he's getting better. And I don't see why that wouldn't happen for Tielemans either. Yeah, Jet in the comments. I'm not sure this is the Jet that I actually know that spilt a load of drinks in Hemman and Cooper once. Let me know if it is the, is the, is the same Jet. He's saying he does play every week. He started Thursday, then Wednesday, then Thursday. What I'm saying is more consecutive games. So, yes, he played those midweek games. I'm not disputing that. But in the league games, he, has, he hasn't started. So, he's not playing consecutive games because he's coming out at the games that are in with the first choice 11 as well. He's played a lot of games where it hasn't been the first choice 11 and it's all been a little bit bitter from various players. So I would say way too early to judge Tillemans. He is a player who I have always loved. A few years ago, if you'd have told me Villa was signing Tillemans, I'd have been like, what? You're joking me? I'd have been absolutely delighted. It just happens that he's come to the club when Villa have got two really other high-level central midfielders who are very difficult to, to take out of the team. So it's going to be a, a longer thing, a, a slow burner with Tillemans, I would say. But if he plays on Sunday against Wolves, we, we, you've got to, got to get behind him. He's, he's a really, really good player, Tillemans. A lot of games behind him, as Dave just alluded to. Probably been playing for, for 10 years, first-team football, at, tw- at 25, 26. So yeah, Tillemans has been around for, for a long time. Interesting you speak about Cash, actually, because I thought he was one of the ones that really changed the game last night when he came on. To my eye, his role has very, very much changed from last season. We don't seem to be building that third centre back like like we did last season as much now. Both fullbacks seem to have a license to get, to get forward, and Cash has been really productive this season. Another assist last night. Yeah, so uh, you're right. Cash has kind of played a couple of different roles, hasn't he? Uh, last season, Emery kind of, um, uh, you know, the first choice eleven had a very kind of. Um, uh, the way of playing was was similar most weeks, where you would build up with the three uh, Young or Cash, uh, Conta and Mings. And now this season, it, it, Emery two point is built in this kind of variations. There's different variations, different ways that Villa can play. And Cash has played as that kind of right sided centre back. And maybe you know, only Unai Emery has kind of seen more from him over the last few months, and he's thought, you know, what we can utilise him further up the pitch. So. In certain recent weeks, anyway, Kamara has been the one to drop back and play that third centre back mm. role. Last night, I quite like. 
Yeah, yeah. Obviously, last night it was concert. Uh, Carlos and, and Long later played the kind of three, three in build up. Um, but in, you know, in recent weeks in the Premier League, it's been Kamara dropping deep and using that, and that's given Luca Dean uh, and Matty Cash the license to get forward. I think it will vary from game to game as to who plays, who plays that role, and it will vary in terms of the opposition. Um, so I think it just shows, you know, different players have got to take on different instructions for different matches. So it's it's you know it's not an easy job for these players to know what they're going to do, what they're going to be asked to do from match to match. I did think the concert right back might be more of a, a European thing, and it's it, it's proving so far to, to to be the case, or a, or a cup thing. You know, concert playing as that kind of making himself the the, the third centre back in in possession. I, I quite liked I quite liked a lot of what Villa did in the second half last last night. Actually, I, and I like the fluid nature of the way we can set up, and that players can take on different roles for di- for different games. You know, Luca Dean is. I hope he's not injured, by the way, because we haven't got another we haven't got another left back. You know, he went off at half time. I don't know whether that was just to manage his minutes a little, a little bit, but you know, to, to be without him with no Moreno at the moment would be a blow. If he has picked up something last night, let, let's hope that that's not the case. But you know, if McGinn's playing from the left, then Luca Dean can come wide. McGinn then operates kind of next to Louise, and Kamara drops back to make that third centre back, and it's Cash and Dean who are pro- providing providing the weakness. There's a lot a lot that we can do. What do you think the score... I oh, know we're not doing score predictions anymore. We've won every game since we did since we did stop doing score predictions. So we're absolutely not that on the head, not, do, not doing that at, at all. But overall, what's your, what's your feeling going into the game rather than a score prediction? <laughs> my feeling? What's your feeling? Um, How are you feeling? What's, what's my feeling? Uh, mm. Feels like therapy. Uh, my feeling is... Um, I don't see why you can't go to Wolves and win. I think you have to go to... The, the, the position and the kind of levels that we've shown in the last nine months, ten months, you have to say that you've got to go to Wolves and expect to win. Now, it's, it's obviously going to be a difficult game, but given what we've seen over the last few weeks, it feels, my feeling is, uh, that you can go and turn over Wolves, but uh, you, you've got to be careful of the counter-attack. You've got to be careful of Neto. Um, so it's going to be difficult. I can see it being close, but you, you've got to back a Villa, Villa win. And who is your key man? Pick one player who you think will be the key man in this game for Villa. Key man. Uh, I mean, Ollie Watkins, isn't it? Ollie Watkins, he's got the hat-trick. He's off the mark. Got a goal against Chelsea. New contract coming in. England call-up. Things are going well for him. Let's get another one. Yeah, I feel like he's had some... I think he scored... I remember he's going a penalty a few years ago at Molyneux Watkins. I think he's had some... Bad days at, at Molyneux in in the past. Ollie Watkins hopefully he can rectify that this this season. I'm going to go for concert just because I think in transition he, his recovery pace is going to be pivotal if, if Wolves do play on the break like like I think think they will. And they've got some tricky operators and he's really stepped up. I mean he was pl- he's been playing well for 12 months as concert, but he spoke himself about having to be the one that's stepping up now without Mings and and, and being that leader. I think he's probably Villa's Villa's key man because if Villa keep a clean sheet. Probably they'll win because we usually score because that's what Unai Emery teams are, are all about. We don't really do nil nil. So if, if 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 we can keep that clean sheet and Concert can march that defence and keep it together, you'd back that we'll probably score a goal against against Wolves. So yeah, I'll go Esri Concer. Dave's gone. Ollie Watkins. No more score predictions because we keep winning when um when we don't do score predictions. So yeah, we'll continue with that. Thanks ever so much to Dave for joining me and those that have joined us live in the chat as well. Thanks to Dave for his impromptu hosting as well while my laptop exploded. That was very much appreciated. Thanks to Lee, who was trying to speak to me whilst my laptop exploded and I had no idea what he <laughs> what he was saying to me. So that was that was good as well. I'll find out afterwards. We'll do a post-match show probably on maybe Sunday night, maybe Monday. We'll, we'll have a look. Greg Evans is going to be back next week. I think he, ha- he, he and his partner have... Do you say he and his partner have given birth? Does that does that make, does that make sense? No, not sure. Strange, strange it, image in my head. His partner, as his wife, as yeah, his wife has, has given birth. So Greg is now a father to to a son. I won't go into too much detail. It's not my news to give, but that's why we didn't do a podcast last week because Greg is now a father. Congratulations to him and his family. Excellent news. Sam in the com- comments called me Mr. Barbell. I'm not sure whether that's been done on 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 purpose or whether it's a it's it's a typo. But I would hope that they know that 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 wasn't my name. But yeah, we'll be back with a couple of shows next week. Fingers crossed for three points. Enjoy your weekend and watching all the football tomorrow as well. And up the villa. <laughs>